Okay, so as we're finishing up the final table situation here, I will start to introduce what the heck this thing is. Has anybody ever participated in an implementation research development workshop or an IDW, IRDW? Okay. So a tiny bit of background. This model is based on a NIDDK funded group. Um, I can't remember the name of the group, doesn't matter. Um, but they created this thing called the bridge model that has then been adapted for implementation uh, research project development. But in short, what we're doing here is we solicited submissions for implementation research projects, typically ones that are still in development, uh, or uh, oftentimes we use this to actually get feedback about how to address and respond to reviewer critiques if you're going to do a resubmission of a grant proposal. And the way that the IRDW format works, you'll see that there is a one-page description of a project that should have questions at the bottom for the IRDW, okay? So this is supposed to be fairly focused on exactly what the submitters of these projects wanted to learn from experts. And now that you guys all participated in a day and a half workshop, y'all are experts, okay? So you get to tell people what to do now. Just kidding, I mean you can if you want to, of course, but no pressure. Okay, so what we're gonna do, um, this is a highly structured uh, situation. So we'll give a couple minutes for people just to take a, you know, take a look at the abstract, the rationale, goals, objectives, and the research question that were submitted. The submitter is then gonna get maximum 10 minutes to talk through the project and ask the questions without any PowerPoint or anything else, okay? That's one of the rules. There is a moderator sitting at the table. Who's our moderator for this first one? Felice is gonna be our moderator. Once the presentation is going, you can raise your hand if you have a comment to give the presenter about their questions, but you can't say anything. Felice will acknowledge that you have your hand raised, write your name down, and you put your hand down. Once the presenter is done, Felice has a list of people who want to say something, and we'll go down the list, and you get to say one point each time that you're called on. So if you have 13 thoughts, you just gotta keep raising your hand, keep getting on the list, okay? Totally fine, but that allows lots of different people to make comments, and people like me don't get to monopolize, okay? as I'm apt to do. That will go on for about a half an hour or until we run out of questions. You are allowed to ask clarifying questions so that you can ask the question you want. So if there's, if you're thinking, you know, I think I have a comment I wanna make or a suggestion, but I need to have clarification about something, you're allowed to ask a quick clarifying question, get the information you need from the presenter. Otherwise, the presenter really is taking in information and someone is going to be taking notes, and we are recording, note taker, right there, and we are also recording so that we can send you these detailed responses. So if you're the presenter, do not take notes at all. The whole point is to listen, take the feedback in, and just kind of stay in the process, okay? Any questions? Yes, yeah, so someone's gonna have to be a mic runner so that we can record. Um, do we have other mics? So we have maybe a couple, like like one on that side and one over here, I don't know. Good, good question. Yep, so basically, like, unless it's your turn to talk, don't say anything. This is like test of people's, you know, self-regulation for sure. All right, so let's take a couple minutes to read uh, and peruse the submission. Are we gonna do Beth Olson first? Okay, so we're doing the other one first. Anywhere as long as you can see, see and hear. I'll 
offer to be the mic brother. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. I'm going to give one more. Okay. Nope. Anna is the first scholar. Oh, okay. Okay. And I'll oh, have microphones. One. Or someone will. Oh, yeah, no, I see. So it should say, sorry, I'm the scholar, I guess. So I, it's, it should say improving system-wide sexual orientation and gender identity data at the top. There's actually a typo on the first page. It's the target funder is NIMHD. And there are questions on the second page. If you get there. Yes, thank you. My bad. Okay, I guess let's go ahead and get started with on this presentation, which 10 minutes or less. First of all, thank you for doing this. This is uh, such a privilege. I don't think I'll ever get something like this again. <laughs> so um, I'll walk through the aims and the questions and see how it is to have people raise their hands while I'm doing that. So this project uh, seeks to address an overall problem that we have, uh, starting with just laying the groundwork that we know that patients that come from sexual and gender minority backgrounds, most of us would call this group of people LGBT, but NIH uses the acronym SGM often. Uh, we know that this group does face a lot of different health conditions for which they might need more or more coordinated care in health systems and a lot of health disparities. But at the same time, uh, our systems, our health systems, like a community health system or, 
or an integrated health system often don't actually have consistent ways to identify which of their patients on a system level are patients from sexual minority backgrounds or gender minority backgrounds or both. And for a long time, we thought that as soon as we had this capacity in the electronic health record data to record this information, that that would sort of solve this problem of not knowing who, uh, who is from different backgrounds and therefore be able to improve how we coordinate care or even know, you know how many providers with different types of training or what kinds of clinics do we need to have or what kinds of referral pathways do we need to set up to make sure that care is coordinated well. So this, uh, this gap I think of as really uh, an, an implementation science problem. We sort of thought that we could just solve it with a structural fix, like having the data field in the EHR, but even systems that are uh, quite specialized for taking care of SGM patients still have issues with collecting this data systematically and having the different um, parts of their data systems talk to each other. And so this is a problem sort of writ large, but it's, it's an even bigger challenge for safety net systems because they, A, often have fewer resources to do the, the super fancy you know, implementation strategies. They, they don't necessarily have learning health system capacity. I wish we're trying to grow that. Um, and they also have patient populations that come from many different backgrounds, culturally, linguistically, um, as far as like technology challenges or in income challenges, this is a, a bigger sort of gap for them between the evidence that emerged around how you collect SOGI data in very specific contexts and for certain patient populations versus what they're trying to do. So what's happening, I think, is that we have this big gap in SOGI data collection at all. It's, it's not a problem that we've solved. And then on top of that, we have safety net systems trying to do this to some extent for their patient populations and kind of not having the tools to do it equitably. So there's like a big barrier to begin with and then I think that barrier is inequitably distributed and will we'll actually potentially lead to more disparity so that those patients who are SGM who even before we had this data capacity were able to sort of advocate for themselves or get connected to the right kind of care you know, they're still probably going to be able to do that and their data is going to be better measured and then other patients who were kind of never equipped to do that or the system wasn't really designed for them or they come from different backgrounds, they're even maybe less likely to get resources directed to them because they're less likely to get the data collected, they're less likely to kind of benefit from this effort. So um, the other sort of I guess, level here is, is the level that we're interested in focusing on. So a lot of the existing research has been really focused on like what exact question do you ask and how do you ask it? What order, you know, how do you get at both sexual orientation and gender identity and, and how do you make these questions really inclusive? And they've also been asked at, um, in a very specific context. So um, I, know I, I know there's more lit review to do here, but even the research that is looking at some of the gaps is often looking at like a certain type of clinic or a certain type of setting like an ER or an oncology clinic or primary care or mental health. But if you're a, a leader in a safety net system and you're trying to think of like well, what are the gaps across the whole system? So how does my patient or a group of patients experience this gap across the whole system? There, there's potentially a need for a solution that kind of takes, a, takes into account all of those different systems. So uh, the, this kind of idea right now is, is set up as an R01 with, with three aims. Uh, and a lot of my questions have to do with, it, is this even you know, one grant? Is it kind of set up for an R01? And what parts of this might go to different types of funders? Or, or is there a world in which this exists as one grant? But the specific aims proposed here are to sort of start with uh, using national level data sets that are that are EHR based primarily to look at at least in those data sets on the national level what are some of those really persistent disparities um, by race by ethnicity by language of care uh, listed sex on record which may be different than gender identity uh, age and different region and, and I would need to find out what other kind of levels we can look at in some of those data 
But that would give us a really good idea of like how big this problem is and, and how persistent it might be in different areas and, and which populations might have the biggest gaps. And in this case, we're just looking at gaps of like who has the data documented to begin with and potentially looking at other things like health disparities that might be most persistent in those populations. But then the second two aims, we're really interested in looking at two specific safety net health systems where we would have EHR data, but also the chance to dive much deeper into specific uh, clinic related disparities, like what kinds of clinics and what kinds of practices are better at collecting this data, what kinds of providers might be doing it better. And basically going into aim three, which is sort of the, I would say most of the implementation researchy stuff to then have a lot of really good data to inform like starting to even assess the specific barriers that are associated with those, those inequities in SOGI data collection and potential linkages to implementation strategies. So, so basically in AIM-3 proposing a lot of, which is why I'm wondering if this is even one grant, but proposing a lot of uh, barriers assessments, for example, with CIFR and then mapping to ERIC and then, and then really focusing on trying to design implementation packages of strategies or implementation packages that deal with adaptations and implementation strategies that are at the system level for these kinds of safety net systems and that specifically target those types of gaps that we've observed. So I kind of hinted at the questions, but the sort of three questions I have on the back are, is it clear how we're thinking of SOGI data collection as the thing here? And there's uh, some folks who do sort of more policy implementation work and so often the thing can just be a policy. Um, in this case, I get a lot of, it's, a hard, it's hard for me to talk about sometimes SOGI data collection. It's not necessarily an intervention in the traditional sense of it's supposed to lead to a very specific health outcome, but it is something that has been encouraged and, and it's seen as sort of an important thing that we should all be doing. So how can I talk about that or clarify that or clarify what the benefits of it are supposed to be and particularly for different funders who might just care about like, in this case, NIMHD I think would care about this overall, but other funders uh, like NIMH sometimes say, well, how does this lead to better mental health? Uh, so that's kind of a question. And then um, the other two are kind of around like packaging this or, or um, splitting it up or what what is ready for kind of an R01 versus earlier work. Can all this sort of fit in an R01 or do you need to maybe do a lot of this like, you know, does AIM-1 have to kind of be its own grant? And then once you have all this evidence, only then can you start applying for grants to kind of go to toward AIM-3. Um, and I guess with that, I also, struggle with like how do we how do we speed up some of the health equity work like we we have a lot of interventions and policies that have been put into place where we we know because they haven't studied all these equity pieces carefully they're going to be and and show evidence that they're kind of not hitting everyone equally so is there a way in grants to sort of skip ahead to fixing the thing like get a grant where you're also fixing the thing and identifying the problems in the same grant and not spending like 10 years getting all the grants to just lay out all the gaps really carefully. I think that's time. We're close to it. I'll stop. Who, clarification question, who will be using the data? Who do you intend will use the data? The health system is using the data to, to inform sort of high level things like, well, what are, what are our referral pathways for different types of conditions? Or do we need specialized clinics because we have over a certain threshold of people um, with different conditions. Um,
have you given any thought to thinking about like using mental health as your target population so that you can make the case? And do you have evidence that screening improves disparities or improves delivery of um, uh, evidence-based treatments that are more effective in that population? So I wanted to hear more about the human health problem and then how this is going to really help advance that. And I think picking a disease area often is the way we can zero in on that. I'm getting nods from many people at the table. Um, so have you given some thought uh, to thinking about mental health or like depression screen? I just think of like a simple, like picking something that's highly prevalent. I'm getting lots of nods here. What would be pros and cons in your mind of, of picking an, a, 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 a disease focused approach? to that or is this now the like I don't get to respond part um, unless it's a clarifying question you're yeah really just it's feedback yeah. so I, I have a point too um, I don't know where we're on the list but okay um, so thinking about the scope um, this to me fits into the intent of like an R21 or potentially an R34 depending on which institute you're going to, not all do R34s, which are preparation for clinical trials. Um, however, depending on the budget that you need and the time horizon that you need, this could be a three or a four year R01 that doesn't get to a trial. Um, and it does read that you could potentially go for one of the clinical trial not allowed RFAs which get far fewer applications. So just strategically, that might actually be a potential way to be in a better position to get funded. I think if you're gonna go the R01 route though, one of your biggest pro possible concerns from a reviewer is um, two health systems is not gonna be viewed as generalizable. So that, that would be a place that you'd almost have to try to increase the number uh, for an R01. If it was an R21, you may be able to get away with it but an R01 is going to expect to have a much more broad and hopefully generalizable group of systems to work from. Anna, so I was thinking that the logical argument on the front end of the specific aims. Oh, sorry. Anna, sorry. Oh, Anna, the logical argument on the specific aims. I was thinking um, I'd, I'd like you to walk me as a reviewer through it more carefully. So, like, what is an L, a learning health system? Believe it or not, you need to define that. Why are they important? How do they function? And then say but we can't do this in this setting because there's no data. That's a core infrastructural gap. And then the punchline is you want to learn how to install that infrastructure so that others can do it as well. That, that's sort of the output. I did raise my hand and Danny, you took the wind right out of my sails. That was exactly what I was gonna emphasize, that there's so much interest in the community at large to, to do exactly what Danny described. Um, that data collection is challenge number one for all health equity reporting. How can you drive outcomes without 
getting that data collection. And it is a true struggle across many organizations for how to do it well. Um, having an, just publishing, I believe, uh, just an, a well outlined strategy that other organizations can take and run with for how to get that data from patients, ideally in a culturally sensitive manner, um, and, and boost the numbers that you're just collecting that data so that you have that underground underlying infrastructure to do additional studies. There's huge interest in that and a lot of struggle across the community. So that right there, I think that's gold for a lot of other folks. I was wondering if uh, maybe you would have a way of focusing on, I guess, the portion of the population on which it matters that those elements get documented, right? Because if you ask probably broadly, um, probably for a good chunk of the population, I don't know if it's 70%, 80%, 90%, the extra data items getting populated may or may not change. And especially, I think if you have a good example of where that absence of data would impact you clinically. Like there's lots of clinical predictions, algorithms, maybe medication dosing, where if you have the incorrect information, have they transitioned, are they in hormones, then th that could screw up. Like the absence of data would have clinical components. So it also gets a little bit at targeting and I don't know if that's like profiling and if that's good or bad, but maybe try to identify the subpopulation where we think it might make more sense to ask them the questions and update their items, rather than having it be a blanket, everybody needs to do it, which seems is a bigger lift. So just thinking through sort of the <clears throat> potential methodology for this, I mean, the way that the aims are laid out is, is relatively um, common. Uh, so the first aim being uh, assessing gaps you know, it's really the identification of barriers and facilitators, right? It's, it's is this, you know, problems with the health, the, with the EHR itself? Is it problems with how we ask the question? Is it, is it reluctance on the part of people to ask or to provide the answers? All of those things go into, you know, understanding the nature of the problem. The uh, second aim with potential drivers of differential impact. So one of the, one of the issues there is that you're assuming differential uptake. So one of the things you might want to do with a larger sample which will allow you to probably have more likely, uh, likelihood of finding variation, is to then focus in on sort of what we would what we call like a positive outlier uh, kind of perspective. So places that are doing it well, trying to really dig into what strategies have they used and what are the incentives that they've you know, got in their system to do that, which will bring you into aim three and having, there's many different ways to do strategy selection but once you have a really good idea of what the barriers facilitators are and what some candidate strategies could be based on these higher performing health systems, uh, you can actually start to engage with all the health systems that are not doing as well and really talk about, the, again, the feasibility, the likely effectiveness of using those strategies in their system and then continue to add to the list to address you know, local contextual factors. So just kind of thinking about getting a little bit more um, purposeful in the kind of strategy or the kind of research methods that you would use so that you get the information you need to move through. Um, I was a little, uh, I had to think a lot about AIM-1 to try to understand what is the specific rationale for AIM-1 in the first two paragraphs. So I didn't see that as clearly. And um, I got the sense that part of the rationale was to look at location of care or health system of care, but that didn't seem to be in AIM-1. It's, it's connected to AIM-2, but um, so when I came out of AIM-1 and moved towards AIM-2 and 3, I didn't have as clear a sense of the purpose for, uh, of needing AIM-1 as opposed to starting with AIM 2 and 3 and maybe a different type of data collection. I'm so naive that I'm afraid to ask this question, but 
Um, your question is around across healthcare systems, but I'm wondering within one patient medical record too, like does that data exist? Like do we know that within one patient medical record that everybody that views that across disciplines is getting the same information? Like from medical laboratory sciences to medicine to all the things. They are not. Oh. It is all over the place. Depends on where they look. And interpreter services does not look at the same stuff. So they are often addressing someone with the wrong pronouns in different languages, too. Um, I also think clarifying, I think this is kind of along the lines of what folks have already said, but clarifying what outcomes you're moving towards would be really powerful here. Um, because when I read this, at, at first I was thinking about um, a, a health problem. Supposedly, not supposedly, we have evidence, but you're building more evidence for mental health issues in sexual gender minority populations. Um, but kind of the outcome that I was gleaning from this from your aims and methodology is it their implementation outcomes data collection um, how consistent uh, it, health systems would collect that data how to measure those things um, whereas then the the distal outcome would be something like improved mental health for this minority population Oh, no. I was thinking that you might consider um, that half of your reviewers are going to think you're talking about data for science, but actually you're not thinking that way. You're, you're, you need data to be able to do the thing the learning health system does. How do you move them away from thinking that you're talking about data for science? Um, I think that could be important. I was thinking about some of the implementation strategies that you might throw along the way and start thinking about training, who gets trained, or the credentials for anyone who's going to do that training to teach providers how to collect the data. Are providers even going to be the ones collecting the data, or is it patient-centered? Can you loop in the community members to help build trust across patients? That's such a huge issue, trust, stigma perceived sense of danger around this topic, around the, in this political environment. Um, so thinking about how to loop in the community, are there things from yesterday that we talked about, um, organizations that are already doing the work, can you bring them in to help facilitate um, that training for users or bringing in active, active engagement from the community? Can they off, offset the cost by being truly interested in helping to support that implementing that data collection? and building that trust simultaneously with those members of the community. Um, and then the challenges around the EHR, is that what needs to be tweaked? Because there's a lot of IT infrastructure around making sure that the system's able to collect the data and show it in the right places, like you just called out. Again, I think this is a really important question, so I'm glad you're doing this work. And, and one of the things I'm just wondering as far as it's sort of a natural experiment that might be an opportunity would be if you could, um, if you know the, the, the rates of um, uh, um, uh, uh, sexual and gender minority uh, populations by safety net hospital, like the ones that have higher reported rates, um, are probably doing a better job of, of data collection. So you could do positive and negative outlier interviews or do deep dives to figure out are they pushing surveys to patients where patients are self-populating this? Are they having MAs routinely ask this question? Like, figure out what the people who have high reported rates are doing um, to learn from them. So that might be another angle. So um, one thought that actually, I don't know where it came from, but it may be relevant, that in some ways this is also a problem for uh, race and ethnicity data. 
Yeah, which is really poorly captured in most EHRs, and it's really inconsistent. Um, and like you said, people are getting different records. We've pulled the same person's record, and it had different race and ethnicity across like four records, which makes no sense. Um, so even you know for NIMHD in particular, um, that would probably be something that would be a really positive hook is to figure out sort of both of these problems because they probably have similar underlying barriers facilitators and potentially similar strategies. But I think it also potentially strengthens strengthens your case because you're getting intersectionality of racial gender minority or sexual and gender minorities and racial and ethnic minorities, and addressing a problem of EHR data quality simultaneously. So that could just be a nice hook, especially if you especially for information. So um, I thought one thing I might call out a little more in AIM three is uh, to bring out that you you would engage uh, beneficiaries and implementers or users um, in that uh, mapping process so that it uh, it sounds almost like you'll get the data and then the academic team will do the work. But I'm sure that um, there is this user-centered approach in there, so you just bring that out. One of the things I think would be important for your grant is to really establish that the disparity in uh, reporting uh, of the data you're referring to has a negative impact on the population you're interested in. And uh, that doesn't come clear here to me. And then when I reflect on my use of a well-known electronic medical record, not a million miles from here, um, the truth is, it's full of stuff that I ignore every day, and I just, 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 it just, I just blow past it. I just go to the stuff that I need, and I, I, I add to it, and then I get out and go into the next patient. And so, it would be useful to show that there is some impairment of care or injury to the LGBTQ population from the deficiencies of the electronic medical record and say, that's why we need to fix this. Uh, the more you can demonstrate that, the better the grant will be, I think. Uh, something that we have been talking about a lot is data quality with respect to race and ethnicity, as well as sex and gender. Um, uh, this is speculation, a concern, but I really wonder if you'll be able to get anything from AIM-1, because this is a national problem with national data quality implications, and I'm really curious about what the data quality is like in something like Epic's Cosmos database. Um, Fun to that, because it's, I think, more of a clarifying question I didn't explain very well. So we've actually, we have looked at this in Cosmos, and actually all we need to look at for that piece is just, is there something in the field right now? Has it been documented at all? And the answer so far is like overwhelmingly that field is empty in Epic. So you're right, if we're trying to figure out like, what is someone's identity, that's, that's like a no-go, but that's almost like the punchline. It's not there. Yeah, it hasn't been documented at all. So that part, it would be who has the data documented. We don't really know if it's, I guess, accurate or how accurate it is, but just is the field populated and how does that vary by language of care, race, ethnicity, age, some of these other things. In that case, I think clarifying that that is... Uh, the gap that you're talking about would make this a lot clearer. Um, <laughs> um, and along those lines, I had something else, but I think I need to let it come back. <laughs> Sorry. I think I'm going to comment primarily on your first question, which is, I think, your general question on if you should be proposing this as a policy to implement at the health system level, and my answer would be for sure yes. Um, 
I think JD had mentioned real D data. A lot of health systems currently are probably in conjunction with SOGI data, pushing initiatives to better improve both the quantity, this is to what Jenna was just saying, quantity and quality of real D data as well as SOGI data. I see those as two very distinct things. So it's whether it's there's completeness in the capture of the data and then also recurrently asking the patient on an annual or some basis to reaffirm that that's actually the correct self-identification for real D data or SOGI data in the system. Um, but on top of that, there because these initiatives have been so profound and are uptaking in IT departments across the nation, there will likely be health equity champions already established at the operational level that you could potentially reach out to and piggyback essentially off of the work that's either being done, projected to be done, or planned to be done in the future. And I'm hoping that can provide perspective on the buy-in that you can get from a top-down level at a health system to really um, state that this is a data quality issue connected to a patient safety issue for the health system. We don't collect this data. We cannot report and improve outcomes, and that will directly affect patient care. It is a patient safety issue. Um, and to kind of help you get the resources that you need to be able to do these types of interventions, improve data collection at the health system. Um, but for sure, highlighting that there are likely health equity champions at these health systems that you're working with, and to definitely connect with them to get that top-down buy-in um, for months-long, year-long kind of data collection improvement projects that you're trying to do. Uh, moving in a slightly different direction, um, I think the the a piece that um, so I'll serve I'll serve in the role of a community member in this question. The piece that's missing for me is um, safety of the people who are disclosing this information, and I think it's important to consider our current political climate. Additionally, I think it's important to. Uh, recognized within different communities, racial and ethnic communities, this information is unlikely to be disclosed. So you might be already working with a population that is not disclosing behavioral things, one based on the questions that are being asked, because I, I think in this is assumption that that you're who's asking these people who they are? And the questions might come up more or less from an identity, but depending on how someone perceives themselves, and more from behavior. And so if there aren't um, an analysis of the types of questions that would lend to identity and or behavior, that would then lead to some kind of care component, I think there's an assumption that everyone's operating with LGBTQ as an identity and or willing to disclose and or sees themselves that way, even though they might engage in behavior that might lend themselves to that population. Thank you, Alyssa. Okay. Um, I really like that last point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and to build on it, um, you know, it might be helpful as preliminary data to show um, what the patient population's needs are. What are their preferences? Hey, I do want to um, report on you know, this information to document that this is something of value to them. Um, and in particular, um, just to build on Beverly's point about which are the variables that people want to be embedded in the record and what are the variable uh, values um, to report as well. Yeah. So just, just quickly, this is a, more of a suggestion potentially, and I don't know if it fits into this grant or the next one, but really about data validation. Um, so Northwestern and a couple of other like big health systems are currently doing natural language processing to actually figure out if they can determine SOGI status from the, the not the field, right? So from other clinical notes. Um, and people have actually shown with some like proof of concept that that can be done. So how many could, you know, just looking at convergence and how many people are you missing and some of those other pieces could be really helpful in that, that 
you know, partnering with somebody who's developed those those NLPs could be really useful. Is that the last? I guess that's the last one. Okay. Um, the other option too, which we usually do with these, is if you have additional comments for the presenter, feel free to write them somewhere. Uh, I guess one of the back, one of these pages probably has a blank back. Yeah, and then you can give to the presenter uh, directly. So if you were too shy to mention it, or you just, you know, have a burning thing to say, um, Anna will probably appreciate it. So. Thank you, Anna. A million dollars right now. So thank you. Hopefully you didn't feel like you were too in the spotlight. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go to our next presenter. Yes, so we'll take a couple minutes to read um, Dr. Olson's, right? Yeah, so take a couple minutes to read Dr. Olson's abstract, and then uh, we'll have her do a presentation, and we'll do the same thing again. Now we're all pros. It'll work really well.
Okay, let's have Dr. Olson do maximum 10 minutes so we can give as much time for feedback. And actually, one thing that would be helpful too is to mention what kind of uh, scope or funding mechanism. To mention what kind of uh, like scope or scale or funding mechanism that you're thinking about. Is that working? Yeah, it is. Um, so I'm Beth Olson, and apologies for running in late. This is actually the exact same two days as the statewide fall extended conference. <laughs> Going back and forth. Um, the funding mechanism we're currently working on would be a we're looking at the NIH R21, um, but we have also submitted this and not gotten funded a few times to ICTER. And so then sometimes the scope has been different. So what I sent now is kind of an influx because we're trying to move back to the, the R21 in our writing. Um, so the background I think was in there. We're interested in um, workplace lactation support for and we're also in transition of our terminology, which used to always be mothers and women, and now we've begun to try to use parents and employees. But the literature is, by, by and large, still using women. Um, but looking at the fact that since 2010, there has been federal mandate for many workers that this be provided since last year. For almost all workers, there are exceptions. And yet women will respond or employees over and over again that they can't use that support. So we have proposed that that's a failure of implementation. The program is set up, it's put out without a consideration of how it, it's actually going to get used. So we want to move away from the burden of breastfeeding, which is often on the individual, to making it um, something that's the responsibility of everybody. We've used implementation climate as our framework or our theory, and it says that people will behave in an environment in a way that is expected, supported, and rewarded. So what we hear in the literature from reports of women, particularly, or parents and coworkers is this isn't supported, and not only not rewarded, it is sometimes punished. The people that are least able to use any type of benefit that a company offers is, are generally the lowest or low wage workers. Those are disproportionately women and minorities. And so expecting them to ask for the supports when they may be afraid of losing their job in the next round of layoffs or in some other mechanism because they made waves and asked for accommodation, we don't think is going to help them. So we've looked at how to develop a guide for implementing these programs. As I talk to companies, most of them have a program, often what is mandated by law, which is pretty minimal. I think even that minimal is really helpful if someone can actually use it. Then, of course, a program could be more deluxe. So what we're proposing to develop is some type of implementation guide or process that would help someone putting out a program or reviewing the program they have and maybe looking at why it isn't used to include the people supports, which we've sometimes called intangibles, and not just the room and the you know time unpaid time off maybe or pamphlets or you know an online support group to include everybody so that the people around them can support them and it can be rewarded. So I, I think that's enough to go on. I don't think I, unless somebody wants to and ask a clarifying question about that. But yeah. Or did, should I say, in developing it, we proposed to use one industry, pharmacy. Um, there is the practice-based research network here on campus who have um, pharmacies who have agreed already to participate in research as an example of a place where you would have a lower wage like farm tax and retail customer service and then a higher paid, um, more likely to be able to take advantage of perhaps the pharmacists as a way to start to look at that disparity in wages 
and what would be helpful to them in terms of a program. Also then involving, we're, we've talked about using a community pharmacy, so it would just kind of be more self-contained. So we would have the decision maker, hopefully the store manager, who probably acts as the HR person, I'm not sure, um, on what their issues are and bringing a program in and implementing it. And then working with some kind of advisory group, which we've been going back and forth about who would be in that to get broader stakeholder input. Then eventually, um, putting it out farther to other HR managers and other industry types to see if that's the kind of thing that would work for them. Long-term goal would be to you know, pilot it and actually use it and see if we make a difference, particularly if we make a difference in the climate, which I have already developed instruments to measure. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting project. I'm a pharmacist by profession, so I kind of resonate with this. I worked in a pharmacy where whenever one of our colleagues wanted to breastfeed, she had to go to the restroom. You know, so I think it's a good idea to use a pharmacy. However, I'm also thinking a lot of pharmacies are space constrained, and that might be a factor when it comes to the broad scheme of things. One thing I was thinking of was whether or not you found an organization that does this really well and looked into how they do it. And probably that might serve as a model for you moving forward. Yeah, we have in the past. It tends to be in an organization where there is an individual who drives it all. So it's been um, a couple of times it's been companies where the CEO's wife is very passionate about that, and for that reason it gets implemented. Um, we've also found it can get implemented really well by someone in HR, and then they leave. And because it wasn't a true climate change, the program goes away. Um, so it's one of the things, yeah, we want to figure out is why do they work and having the belief from the theory that if it's not, I don't know, say institutionalized, it goes away when the person who cares about it goes away. Uh, kind of a complicating of that, mentioning the pharmacy is, in reality, even in a big company, you like these Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers, you know, in a company of 500, it might be two women in a year who would even be having a baby, who may or may not breastfeed. So the benefiting people are not only often lower wage women, they're small, a small number. Not like parenting, where you know you have a lot of people in your company, or something like healthcare, where everybody wants that benefit. So I wanted to offer, um, because you're using pharmacists, a couple things, um, around the space constraint, or the concept of adaptation as well as cost and the number of people who might be lactating within a given year, that kind of calculation becomes really important for something to become institutionalized or a policy or sustainable. Um, additionally, you're asking questions around um, racial and ethnic part part um, partitions. Given the number of, of people who aren't in the pharmacy world that are of color that, that that measurement might not be a, re, a significant one, particularly if where your pharmacist is located. So th that seems like a, something maybe way down the line when you have multiple facilities in multiple different regions, but as kind of a starting point, but those people might be really valuable on your advisory board. And when you think about your advisory board, I think it's important to consider lactation consultants as like a primary resource about how you calculate the timing of optimum um, pumping and the feasibility within an eight or 12 hour workday um, in a space like a pharmacy. And then there's this, the other piece, the perception of the peers of this person taking breaks all the time. So those are some things to consider. Yeah, a um, nice example of that has been in communication with another researcher who has done more with just use of paid time off and the constraints of the low-wage worker. And she had spoken to me. She wasn't specifically looking at lactation room use. And it was in, within the healthcare system. And indeed, there was a disparity, disparity between the nurses and like the CNAs in race and ethnic background. And the CNAs, the certified nursing assistants, said they wouldn't use the lactation rooms. 
And the quote she gave me was, they already think we're lazy. You know, they think I'm going there to put my feet up. You know, so I'm not going to use it. So that's, an, you know, the kind of thing we hear about. It might be available in terms of existing. And at the same time, she said, the nurses would say, I don't want to cover her duties. That's why I got a degree. I worked really hard for my degree so I could be a nurse, not a CNA. So then they had this disconnect in um, terms of how each viewed the other. And so I think that's something where we want to kind of understand that. And, you know, it does involve, I think it would involve a significant investment at times. Like, if the nurse can't take care of her patients in the ICU, who is going to, you know, the coverage of jobs, which is where the coworker and the manager become so important, I think, and are developing this. Uh, yeah, so um, as a community pharmacist myself and someone that does pharmacy research, um, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I'm really excited about the use of, of community pharmacies. Um, one comment was um, just in watching language. Uh, so community pharmacy is not synonymous with independent pharmacy. Um, so you can have a community chain pharmacy, which is like your Walgreens, CVS, as well as your community independent pharmacies. It sounds like in this study you're looking for independent pharmacies, um, but just also recognizing, too, that sometimes there are some unique challenges with that population. I mean, it's well worthwhile studying, uh, but pharmacy workforce uh, currently is um, at a mess. Uh, hopefully it is better by the time this grant gets funded, um, but also recognizing um, in pharmacy, there's no current protection for any workplace conditions, um, not guaranteed breaks, not guaranteed lunch breaks. Um, it's an organizational policy, um, but also sometimes that that can be conflated and often better in independent community pharmacies. Um, and often these organizations do not have HR. Um, it's just the owner who's often the pharmacist who often um, is looking over things. And oftentimes the technicians have better quote unquote working conditions than the pharmacist. The technicians get the breaks, the technicians get the lunch, the technician may have more agency in saying like, yes, I need a break, as opposed to the pharmacist. There has to be a pharmacist present in order for a pharmacy to be open and dispensing prescriptions. So there's additional legalities um, that just may be helpful to either flesh out, including your advisory board, um, or justify in this reason for selecting pharmacies. And the whole net. Thank you, great point. <clears throat> All right, um, Jack, um, when you gave your presentation, and when you started off, I found that very helpful. And um, it, the content said a lot, presented, said a lot more than I read in the proposal here. And what I would recommend is um, basically getting a transcription and writing what you said, okay? In particular, I'll, I'll just kind of specify this here. Um, the, this is some of the words that I think I heard you say, uh, failure to implement, um, like there's this policy, but there was a failure to implement. I didn't see that in the text, but maybe I just read it too quickly and it didn't sink in. But I, I would like to see that really clearly stated and, um, and then like explain what are the factors contributing to that failure. You know, it's like here's the problem. Here are, your, here are the factors contributing to the problem. Here's some possible solutions, and here's our solution. You know, like kind of a layout of like that. And so, um, you know, I, as I was reading this, I know that there's um, quite a lot of uh, phrases pertaining to like organizational culture, and I was still struggling to figure out like who's this intervening on? Like, who is it? the organization level or is it the employee level? So I just um, would find it helpful to make it really clear who's this really affecting or um, yeah, what the target is. Um, and I, I know we should only limit this to like one or two points, right? But I'll be done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, oh. Yeah, thank you. I think we started to do some of what you're talking about in our table. And yesterday I thought, I feel like we have the beginnings of a logic model in that table. Um, and that I think would help clarify our level. Because I think in the study we want all the levels input, but the product target would not be the beneficiaries. They wouldn't have that power to bring in a lactation program. It would be HR. 
probably. That seems to me, when I've talked to HR people, they're the entry. They go up often, but it doesn't come in at the top, you know, the CEOs or managers or whatever. It comes in at the HR level, which is why we wanted to involve them, too, as much as we could to see what, what would motivate them. Small clarification before we move to Jane. The table is somewhat difficult for some folks to read, so you might need to expand upon it or if you can provide it later for folks with questions. I think we did that 8.5 font. Yeah. <laughs> we were trying to get the whole thing on one page. But we also, in our other, in our bigger document, we have a figure which does some of this of seeing how those different frameworks and theories we're using interact. So organizational change, implementation climate, um, the mechanisms, you know, the actions around the mechanisms. So uh, I think that um, I, I felt like there was a little mismatch. And, and then I tried to think through, there's multiple problems, but as I heard you presenting, if, you, if the organization doesn't have the motivation, sort of like the theory of change, you know, you, if you don't have the motivation, you're going to have a hard time moving forward. So then I started thinking, um, perhaps what you really want to be focusing on, if, if you can show that a motivation is sort of a fundamental problem, is a motivational change intervention at an organizational leadership level with supporting tools that come once you have the motivational change. But um, it may be a different theory. I'm not quite sure. But that was where I sort of felt that the um, rationale, the paragraphs were driving me to want to change organizational motivation. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to put on my like grumpy reviewer hat, um, which fits me really well, unfortunately. Um, so one one challenge I think you're going to have the way that it's currently written is you, you don't have any outcomes. You have an output, which is a implementation guide, which in the, the way an implementation scientist thinks that this is this is basically like you're developing an implementation strategy. What's typically expected in this type of a grant is at the very least, you then, once you have the guide, assess its usability, acceptability, feasibility, appropriateness, some of those kinds of things. Um, ideally, and I think if you don't propose this, you'll need to give a really strong rationale why not, is that you, you typically would want to pilot it, right? Because that gives you the pilot data for the larger scale-up trial. Uh, that would actually show whether or not it works. So that and that may depend a little bit too on uh, mechanism again. Like an R34 would actually be pretty ideal for this, where the first 18 months are really the development, showing acceptability, feasibility of the guide. And then you have a 12 month essentially pilot study and six months to do, you know, analysis and dissemination and whatnot and prepare for your R01. But as a as a reviewer, I'd have a really hard time not seeing any implementation outcomes at all. Um, and I don't, I don't know if just creation of a guide would be sufficient. I don't know if people, if you, maybe you would have thoughts on um, outcome. Because um, there are so few women, in, it's so hard that, to get a breastfeeding outcome. Yeah, so that's, that, that's the issue with something like this, is that you're, you can't, you're not going to get outcomes at the, at the patient level or at the recipient level. Not in a pilot study, partially because it's going to be really hard to get a sufficient number. So that's why you're going to focus on acceptability, feasibility, et cetera. Um, the potential of just getting to adoption in the pilot study would be critical. So are pharmacies actually willing to adopt this? And then, of course, the assumption would be that if they adopt it, they then apply it. But you may not have the time horizon to get to application if they don't have you know, someone who's breastfeeding currently. That's another way that you could actually do your inclusion criteria, though, is if you have a large enough group of pharmacies, you could actually say, is anyone currently breastfeeding or is anyone pregnant, planning to get pregnant in the next six months? Um, then you up your chances of having, having the ability to actually implement and use the guide. Hi, hi Beth, over here, Danny. Um, 
I'm going to build a little bit on, on JD's, and I had planned to say something similar, so I'm going to come at it from a slightly different angle. When I read the, the top matter, I felt like you weren't laying down the arc. Like, where are you already going? Reviewers really want to see the arc. They don't want to give you a grant to start from like complete inertia zero. So, so after you describe the WLS, that's the practice, okay? Your goal here is about implementation, right? So I, I would frame it something like, in preliminary work involving blah, 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 we identified an initial set of barriers, blah, 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 blah. And we use these findings to develop a beta version of an implementation strategy. Notice, notice the arc I'm showing the reviewer. Like, I've already done a bunch of stuff. In this prior work, we also identified the need for additional formative work to blah, 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 blah. Right? Like, you did a little bit, but man, I need money to do more. You following me? And then you say, the specific aims of this study are to conduct a small-scale pilot hybrid type 3, and the primary aim is, get ready, to continue to refine the blah, 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 best it. That's the number one. Using, and then now you throw in a bunch of like methods, you know, uh, using an advisory board, using user-centered design, using focus groups, whatever. Secondary aim one, to assess the feasibility, acceptability, and blah, blah, blah of this strategy. Right, JD, am I hitting numbers? And then secondary aim three, to conduct a pilot confirmatory randomized trial to ensure my team is prepared for a full-scale trial. Notice, you know what I mean? You're giving them that arc. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Um, I gotta get the keywords down. <laughs> mm. All right, hi again. Um, I'm just trying to focus my thought here. Um, you know, I was thinking about the um, yeah, sure. Can you hear that? I was thinking about like, you know, if you're going to select pharmacies, um, you know, it'd be helpful to justify you know, that group here. Um, and uh, in particular, with regard to the design, I'm, I'm just kind of throwing this idea out there and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, would you want to select pharmacies with um, few women? Um, as kind of like the most challenging kind of context, and then um, and then pharmacies with more women to see like you know how well does the intervention work in that context. So just wanted to throw that out there as maybe um, to lend to more um, uh, comparison in your analysis. Um, thank you so much for presenting this. It's really helpful to hear all the comments as well. Uh, my question is going to your first question about the best way to use an advisory board. Um, based on all the way it was written, I had a question about the purpose of it and if it was a one-shot type of group, just looking at um, interview guides, or if it was a long-term where then it would be a type of board. And then also thinking about, uh, based on the other comments from others about the HR and then how do you imagine them being involved within this community advisory board or group? I'll try to go in order, sorry, get this clear. Um, I'm not sure on the advisory board, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Some of it is this, which grant mechanism and how much money it had um, so that we can have the funding to keep convening them. Um, at one point we talked about, you know, maybe four gatherings in a year. So initial, bring it back. Um, the composition, we've looked at both people who would re represent groups that we just might not get enough of in pharmacy. So we have some relationships with breastfeeding support organizations for minority populations. Also looked at some academic expertise, for instance, in implementation climate, the person I've spoken with there, HR. Um, we have, in ones we've put in, gotten letters of support from a former HR director and a current one based here in Madison, trying also not to have too big of a board so that we can let them all speak. 
I don't know if there's anybody else who there might be others that have left. Yeah, thanks for bringing up this important topic. I also had some questions about the outcome measure in terms of what's going to be clinically relevant. Um, my concern is that there's this in, in kind of conflict with employment. So who is your denominator, right? So a lot of women, especially if you're in a low-wage job, will simply say it's not worth the effort. I may have additional kids at home. I can't afford to be working and breast pumping and try to have somebody watch my kids. And so I worry that your denominator is going to be very challenging because you may get 100% compliance with this guide among the women who choose to stay employed at those pharmacies, but you may actually have a large proportion of people, mostly women, leaving the workforce for that period of time when they choose to press pump feed. So I just think that that's something to consider in terms of thinking about your denominator, your population that you want to study, you know, even though obviously you're really interested um, for good reason in reaching out to vulnerable populations, it might be better to start with studying populations where people are more likely to stay employed in the same job and seeing their choice of breast pumping versus formula or something like that, where you're going to have a better understanding of without the dynamic of the, um, you know, choosing not to stay employed in that position. Thank you. I mean, I think that is a challenge. We sometimes used phrasing of women who return to work intending to breastfeed. There's, of course, a whole group of women who, regardless of work, are choosing not to breastfeed, and so we, I don't think we can change that. I don't think in the short run we can have women who discontinue because they're coming back to work. We might not get that, but I think in the longer run, that would be something I would hope would come about, is that it becomes feasible for someone to say, oh, I could return to work and still pump because now they have all this who might be giving up. One of the things we do find is in some of the literature, not always just breastfeeding, but just child care, is there are people coming back and extremely early because they can't afford not to. So they do come back, but then they can't breastfeed or they can't take off when their kids are sick or whatever because they can't afford the unpaid time off or their jobs are at risk. On the contrary, in work we've done, we have found that higher wage workers often have a lot of the privilege, private office, control, job autonomy has come out really big in our last study as a predictor. But they, we also talked to a lot of women in that position who said, oh, I'd support all my workers to do that. Now, I didn't do it because, you know, essentially what they were saying is I'm too important. Like, I have too many meetings, too many responsibilities, I couldn't have possibly done it. So also looking at if you change the climate, can you change that so they become role models so that the lower wage worker can say, she was back at six weeks, she never took time off. I mean, you know, what, am, what am I going to do? So I, I think a reason that we want to look at it at the climate level is that it, targeting a group may not be as effective as saying we're all going to support this. If I may, I'll just throw in a couple of analogies we've used. Um, one is like um, access for people who, are, who have disabilities. The kind of idea that an organization would say, well, I'm going to have this access to my building, even if I've never seen anybody need it, because that's just what we do. And the one time someone needs it, it's there. Or the similar for a manager, that they would say, well, I haven't really had somebody who needed to have, you know, signing. But yeah, I, yeah, I think we should have that available just in case there is one. So they also getting at the sometimes the lack of awareness of need. We had a lot of managers who say, yeah, I'd support that. Nobody's ever needed it in my department. And I think, well, they probably did, but they don't communicate it. Also dealing with that, it is a sensitive topic. So we've had managers say, of course I'd support a woman to do that. I'm never going to bring it up with her because I'm not going to say the word and like that'd be personal and invasive. And so a part of what we would like to do in the guide is provide crutches or suggestions or ways of dealing with it so that the manager isn't coming and saying, oh, I see you're pregnant. Are you going to breastfeed? They're going to say, here's our company policy. Here's all the things we offer. I want you to know about it so that they have something they're bringing officially 
and not just themselves saying, are you going to breastfeed? Which they've told us they're not comfortable with. So um, I'm going to do two points, but one of them is just underscoring. I think you're going to have to give a really strong rationale for why pharmacies. Um, and not only just why pharmacies and why you're picking them, but also the generalizability of the guide to other retailers. Um, it's going to be a question that someone's going to ask. Um, the other point, though, I think with the advisory group, I think you do need an advisory board, but I would not only have that. So I think you have a potential major pitfall in saying, I'm going to ask some advisors what to do, and then I'm going to go do it, and then get their feedback again. I think you, I think you really want to have more of like a work group that actually has people who are going to be the implementers and the adopters who actually do a lot of the writing and creation of the guide. So this is one of those things of you know, top down, like, oh, expert's going to write this and tell me what to do, less likely to be adopted than if they actually have Folks who are, you know, on the ground, in the middle of the thick of it, who actually contribute to the writing. So in that case, you'd probably have two. You'd have a large, you know, advisory group that's pretty diverse, and you'd have a work group that is much more involved, actually doing the writing, who takes cues and obviously suggestions from the advisory board. Um, as a health equity and health disparities researcher and PhD candidate. I just wanted to provide some feedback on language um, and um, hopefully this will help. Um, the, the You mentioned how things are starting to change in terms of language. Um, one thing um, that may be helpful is to kind of think through the word vulnerable um, and minority. Um, the literature is moving towards, it, it can be victimizing, um, and um, the literature is actually moving towards identifying the reason why someone may be vulnerable. So um, I would suggest may, maybe changing some of your language in your abstracts. Um, thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, Example, his, historical minoritized communities, um, communities that may have been disadvantaged um, due to certain reasons. So that's what I would suggest changing it to. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, another thing, too, uh, in terms of language, I would stick to the roles of uh, it's like pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, I would take a, take out of like lower paid or less educated. That can be um, kind of victimizing as well. So, so uh, kind of to along the lines of JD's point of you know, imagining broadening it over time. So right now it's just focused on this space of pharmacy. My my immediate thought was food industry. How are you going to tackle the food industry, waiters and waitresses and minimum wage workers and fast food fran uh, franchises? So as maybe a recommendation or a strategy to do that is to start tackling the barriers that you encounter in the pharmacy space that are applicable in other industries as well. Someone mentioned confined space of the pharmacy. That's very relevant to a lot of places with this particular challenge. Um, varying managerial structures, not every place has an HR department, who's the manager and what do they look like and how do you adapt to those different power structures, very clear power dynamics um, across folks, how do you tackle that and at what level, how do you adapt to each level of managerial structure you mentioned like, oh, well we want the managers to also use this benefit, that's a great example of how you start tackling those infrastructure issues. And a fast-paced environment, right? And how fast is this workplace and does that impact the folks' ability to use these benefits? And then how can we show how we tackle this in this environment that can be replicable in other spaces as well? I'll move up so you're not creaming your neck. Um, thanks, Beth. I, I was really struck by uh, some of what you talked about that also like didn't wasn't either on the page or didn't jump off the page. And... I was curious if either as like a selling point for the reviewers or potentially 
outcomes or sort of bigger picture if you think that kind of getting this right would help with people not leaving the workforce or bringing people into the workforce who would see that as a barrier otherwise. So I wondered if there's evidence of any of that, like do, you know, sort of for like someone getting to the point where like, not only should we be studying this, but we should be studying it in pharmacies. Is there evidence that having some of these policies or like family leave policies or similar policies are helpful for retention or hiring? which also gets at, I think, even just setting up the um, kind of crisis in the pharmacy workforce and pharmacy-related workforce as a, as a part of, like, does this help with that? Might help with getting the reviewer, I guess, to be like, yes, we need to do this, and, and pharmacy is a good place to do this right now as an example. So I, I guess it's kind of like, is, is that a reason to be doing this? Is that a good way of maybe selling it, but also does that maybe change how you think about some of the outcomes you might be collecting? Is there a way to kind of even talk to people who have left the workforce or might be considering entering it and say, like, if something like this was in place, if you had this, would you be more likely to, would it be better for you to work? How would it change your decision? I don't know where that fits in, but um, it seems like pieces of this that could be fleshed out. Yeah, thank you. In our bigger proposal, we do use... Um, company because the company needs to accept it you know and <clears throat> in the health field of course we say well if more women breastfeed that's beneficial for the public but the companies might not necessarily be as motivated by that and in fact i've talked to a few and and they aren't <laughs> disappointingly but recruitment and retention is big and so as a you know as a strong policy throughout the company recruitment and retention and not just of those who would use it but others who see it as a marker of a company that values families. And in, uh, I have done some work with a large pharmaceutical company with people at their corporate headquarters, and that has resonated um, with them more, this idea of recruiting and retaining who they have. Um, unfortunately, I've also talked to HR directors who have said, you know, I don't think my not having this big program is hurting me recruiting and retaining. And I think that's why the bigger company I talked to made a very deliberate effort to package it under parenting programs. Just one more in our parenting lineup, as opposed to, I want to introduce a new thing. It was, we're just expanding our current parenting. And so we do have measures like um, that we've talked about in, if we had a larger study or we're doing a pilot job satisfaction, for instance. The other thing in terms of outcomes we've talked about is meeting, which a lot of um, lactation researchers will use is meeting breastfeeding goals. Because everybody has different goals. It might be six weeks, six months, a year. We can't expect to necessarily see that. But if someone says, I didn't meet my goal because of work, or I met my goal because my work was more helpful, we wouldn't be as tied to having an actual breastfeeding rate as an outcome, which we're very unlikely to see but rather their intent. And intent is a predictor of total um, breastfeeding. So that would be one way we get at it. I'm not so sure about the need being different in pharmacies, although you're right. I mean, I went through the Walgreens drive through to pick up my prescription, and I couldn't have it because there wasn't a pharmacist <laughs> there. So I do understand right now they're in a bad way in some ways, and I think we could probably use that. Yeah. Yeah, make it real quick. All right, so um, my question is also about language. And um, there were a lot of phrases used maybe interchangeably or related to each other, breastfeeding, lactation support. I was confused. Um, and for someone, I breastfed for a whole year, stuck to it. And um, I, I don't understand what the WLS, how you're defining it. So when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, do you mean um, enabling women to pump at the workplace or go home and feed? The, like when I hear the word breastfeed, I think I'm holding my baby and doing it, you know, as opposed to pumping. So I, I don't know what we're talking about here. Is, is this supporting a woman to pump in a 
closet <laughs> or or go home or take maternity leave to you know do this so a little more clarification and, and exactly defining what we mean by the WF uh, component that can be really quick too um, just a recommendation that I think this would be a prime spot for human factors engineering as well they come up with really nice lists of what you need in your built infrastructure and how to do it. They could go to the places that do it really well and that have, you know, an outlet, a clean place that's not a bathroom, a refrigerator, um, and then make that checklist to give to HR. HR can pass it on to the next HR person. Um, so there's a little bit more consistency than just, you know, institutional memory. But this is really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. That was, um, I'm not sure if it's in this version, but we had put in the word facilities because that turned out in one company to be the big issue was facilities didn't have a spot or, you know, the key or things like that. And um, in fact, in the company I talked to, the two key people are, one is under kind of doing the benefits of, for family and the other is a facilities person. Thank you, everyone, for all your comments. If you have additional comments or feedback, feel free to jot them down, and we'll give them to Dr. Ol Olson right now or in the minute before. If you're staying for the consult session, we're going to still regroup back here at 1.30. I apologize but that it's a quick lunch, but uh, our guest faculty need to go home tonight. And so we're still going to do that. For everyone else, thank you. You're welcome to stay if you want to. Um, thank you so much for coming. We've sent out the post-course survey for feedback, so please fill those out. And we really appreciate it. Um, if you have other questions or things, um, I'll be here for a couple more minutes, too, so happy to answer them. Thank you.